On June 4th, 2019, the same day Season of Opulence launched, the next expansion for Destiny 2 would leak online, Shadowkeep. This one image was data mined from the PC game files and had many players in deep discussions online after its release. And this leak was a bit hilarious considering in two days time Bungie had planned to reveal Shadowkeep properly on June 6th in a live stream, but the data miners beat them to it. After two days of theory crafting and speculation online, we'd finally get to see it for ourselves. The stream started off with an Eris Morn focused trailer that would set up the story of Shadowkeep. Eris had discovered nightmares from our past haunting the moon. We weren't really quite sure what nightmares from our past meant yet. Old enemies being resurrected, relatives of enemies like Crota, what exactly were nightmares? Luke Smith and Mark Noseworthy would take it from here. The question on everyone's mind since Bungie's gone truly independent and is in you know, complete control of Destiny's future, we're publishing the game now, we're an independent company, is now what? What's the plan? Where are we headed? And so the vision for Destiny going forward, the Destiny franchise, is contained in like three parts. The first part is being an awesome action MMO. And yeah, we, we like, like, we've been worried about that term for a long time. You know, we've, we've shied away from using MMO. that. Yeah, because it, it comes with a lot of baggage. It's like, does that mean it's a subscription game or you yeah. gotta play with a mouse and keyboard or whatever, but like, man, you know, this is one of those things. We're on our own now and it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like we, we can accept the fact that this is what the game is like. Bungie finally came out and said it. Bungie is an independent company and are committing to the game being considered an MMO. Now like they said, they have shied away from this term in the past and instead used terms like shared world shooter and living breathing world, but now it's official. They want the game to be known as an MMO. And Destiny has always had MMO elements, raids, weapon and armor grinding, crafting to some degree, social interactions in the world. And Destiny 1 was always considered an MMO light experience because it wasn't quite massive for one thing, and it was instanced a lot throughout its gameplay. You had to do things like select missions and activities through orbit, so it wasn't fully seamless in an open world either. Classes were unique, but not quite as distinct as traditional MMO classes. But with Bungie now committing to this MMO title, what did this mean for the game? When we say MMO, we don't mean like subscriptions. We're not, we don't mean, we don't mean subscriptions. We do mean uh, two things. The first part where we're lacking right now, and we've like been getting better, Forsaken certainly adds to it, is improving the RPG. Yeah, we really you know, want deeper build customization for, for our players and, and for your characters. You know, you're creating these monster killing machines and you want to make them your own, and we can do a lot more there. And so a bunch of what we're doing this fall is going to be about adding the stats back into the game, RPGing the game more than it was. And D2 launched, launched away, Forsaken improved it, and we think Shadowkeep's going to take that kind of to the, to the next level. Deeper RPG build crafting would be returning to the game. More stats and customization of those stats would be the focus, and more than we'd ever seen before. This is such a stark contrast from the vision Bungie initially portrayed to us for Destiny 2 Vanilla, where things would be more streamlined, and they were saying things like, we don't want players to feel like they made a mistake somewhere in customizing their armor or subclass. The next major highlights announced by Luke and Mark were 1. A single evolving world, meaning plans for more Dreaming City style curse events for the future of the game. Number 2 was cross save was coming to the game. Number 3, Destiny 2 is going free to play with all year 1 content being available for those free to play players. Number 4, seasonal content can be purchased a la carte. Number 5, Destiny 2 is switching to Steam for PC. And number 6, no more PlayStation exclusive content. These announcements were pretty big for the game. Cross save has been a long requested feature as well as no exclusive content and seasons and expansions being a la carte. But the biggest and most important announcement here might be that Destiny 2 is going free to play. More players getting a chance to hop in, but free to play monetization would be a concern of course. Next up was a Vidoc going over the nightmare storyline and returning to the moon. But most importantly we got a look at how the RPG aspect of the game would evolve. Armor 2.0 including a bunch of new mod changes and more stats to mess with than ever before. The seasonal artifact that unlocks more mods and would serve as an endless way to obtain power level. Finishers would be added to the game that allowed you to kill enemies with a unique animation when their health is low. And we got to look at some new exotics including the famous divinity which would be coming in Shadowkeep. Then we get a look at something that didn't age too well. Alright it's time. Oh, it's about to get loud here. 1v1. 1v1 on the board. 
One of the things we really want to focus on, especially with Season 8 and uh, the start of Shadowkeep, is a renewed focus on PvP. Why are you lying to me? You're lying. There's plenty to tell. You just won't tell it. You're lying. Am I going to have to stand here all day until you tell me the truth? The New Light experience was explained a bit more detailing just what content players could play for free. All of the Destiny 2 Year 1 campaigns, Red War, Curse of Osiris, and Warmind, as well as their respective raids. All PvP maps and modes, all strikes, you can visit each destination, and full access to Gambit. This was Bungie's first expansion since the split from Activision, and this was their chance to show us the new Bungie-controlled vision for Destiny 2. We can completely build Destiny in the vision that we want it to be in. A vision that isn't dictated by a commercial model or a business plan, but our creative vision and what we want to do for our players and what they want us to do with Destiny. Are you sure about that? The reveal stream would be concluded with Datto doing a Q&A session with a few of the developers. Trials? Question mark? Because PvP for the last year has been, here's a new comp weapon. Some additions we want to make to the house, but first we've got to like look at the house and repair the foundation and we've got like work to do and maintenance to do. You know, I know people love trials. I certainly love trials. We want to like, we want it to be the ultimate version of the game over time. Okay, but when is it coming out? We've got work to do. Originally supposed to launch on September 17th, 2019, Shadowkeep would receive a delay due to quality concerns, as Bungie put it, and would instead arrive on October 1st. Some speculated that the delay might have been related to Borderlands 3 releasing just four days before the 17th of September, but there's no way to know for sure. On October 1st, Shadowkeep would bring a new campaign with six story missions. And this time the campaign took a little bit longer, but only because of in between missions there were some drawn out grindy bounty style quests, which were kind of annoying and just interrupted the flow of the campaign. A few of the story missions themselves weren't too bad. It had a really great intro mission that had us fighting alongside NPCs to reclaim the moon from the hive. The Destiny 1 First Light Crucible map made a cameo as well, which was a nice little touch. And towards the end of the mission, we'd get the big reveal. A pyramid ship is deep inside the moon. This was the first time we'd ever seen the pyramid ships actually in-game, as we've only seen it once before in a cutscene from Destiny 2 Vanilla. A few of the other story missions had us hunting down nightmares, meaning old enemies from Destiny 1 like Fogoth, Tanix, and Omnigol, and these missions would be later used as nightmare hunts for the post-campaign content. Another mission would be a story version of the Scarlet Keep Strike, where we defeat Hash Ladoon. The final mission, we'd approach the pyramid and be sucked inside where our ghost would be possessed by the darkness and we'd fight through some of our more major nightmares, including Crota, Gaul, and the Fnatic. This was our first time in a pyramid ship ever in Destiny 2 and for the only thing inside to be nightmares was a little bit disappointing. There were no new enemies or even a new hive boss or something like that. But after defeating the nightmares, however, we'd get a pretty interesting cutscene where we'd be teleported or hallucinate the Black Garden. And who would be speaking to us there? We are not your friend. We are not your enemy. We are your salvation. When the cutscene ends, we're teleported back to the moon next to Eris with no explanation to how we escaped or what happened after our conversation with the darkness. Eris just tells us that they are not our salvation and gives us a few quests to do on the moon and defeat some nightmares. The campaign had a really great first mission and setup, a few lackluster missions in between, and then a finale that had us speaking to the darkness in a pyramid ship, which was really cool, but fell kind of flat due to the gameplay of the mission and what happened after, which was basically nothing as far as the story goes. After the campaign, we had a few new things to explore on the moon. For one, the Destiny 1 location was now updated with lost sectors throughout, which were actually pretty sweet. They did a great job expanding on the existing areas of the moon, and it was pretty fun to explore for the first time. A whole new section of the moon was added as well, Sorrow's Harbor, which had a new public event style activity called Altars of Sorrow. It was fairly challenging, especially at release, and was a decent distraction that came with a few unique weapons that could be earned from the activity. Eris Morn had her fair share of quests and such that could earn you some more new weapons and armor sets from the Lectern of Enchantment, which was a little bit like crafting, but more like a precursor to Umbral Engrams. Nightmare Hunt missions had us chasing down tons of old enemies. There were eight of them, and they were fine gameplay-wise, but comparing their boss fights to their original fights in Destiny 1, it's clear the originals were much better. 
Fogoth, for example, was insane in Destiny 1, not just because he was hard, but because he would shake your screen and give you real anxiety when fighting him. He was terrifying. Destiny 2, he didn't shake the screen or cause much fear, even though he was considered a nightmare here. He was hard in Destiny 2 if you played it on Master Difficulty or something like that, but he really wasn't much of a spectacle compared to what we saw with him in Destiny 1. D1 Fogoth was a real nightmare. The loot from Nightmare Hunts wasn't too bad though, especially if you played them on Master Difficulty. You could get some pretty cool new mods and stuff like that. They were kind of similar to Nightfall rewards and were tied to Lectern quests. Shadow Keep would bring us two new strikes. The Scarlet Keep where we defeat Crota's daughter Hashla Dune, and it's actually a pretty good strike. You cover quite a lot of ground and traversing through the keep is awesome, but as for replayability, it's not everyone's favorite because it runs a bit long. The second strike took place on Io, the Festering Core, which was one of the first places we would learn a bit more about Savathun and her plan to gather strength by using the Vex technology. Eris provides some interesting lore in the strike that was pretty telling for the future of the game. And in terms of gameplay, the Festering Core was one of the better strikes in the game, and it's unfortunate it would later get vaulted. Shadowkeep brought us the second dungeon in Destiny 2, the Pit of Heresy. Opinions on this one were a bit more mixed than Shattered Throne. The aesthetic was really nice and the final boss was a lot of fun, but a few of the encounters were pretty boring. Still, it was nice to have another dungeon in the game and Pit of Heresy did bring something unique with it. A secret boss fight that was part of a questline for one of the new exotic weapons, Xenophage. This secret boss was really cool, had some pretty different mechanics, and I really hope to see more things like it in dungeons in the future because Pit of Heresy is the only dungeon that has a whole separate hidden boss or something like that. Garden of Salvation was the new raid taking place on the Black Garden, an area we've always wanted to explore, and aesthetically the Garden of Salvation did not disappoint. It's one of the most beautiful places in the game, and like Last Wish and Forsaken, it was tied into the narrative of both Shadowkeep and the Season of Undying, where we would use the orb from the end of the campaign to pick up a signal that leads us to the Black Garden and the Sanctified Mind, who once killed, turns to stone, and we discover a scale from a pyramid that was the source of the signal we'd been tracking from the mysterious orb. From the gameplay side of things, Garden of Salvation was a bit weaker than the previous raids. Not in all encounters, but it was a bit slower and more deliberate, full of some kind of weird and janky mechanics. The raid had a few good moments, but overall it was a bit underwhelming and would go on to age a bit poorly, at least to most players. The loot wasn't all that exciting either, except for the exotic weapon Divinity. To get Divinity required an Outbreak Prime style questline from the Wrath of the Machine, but not quite as complex. Shadowkeep would bring one new Crucible map, Fragment, and two old maps from Destiny 1. Crucible Labs would get 3v3 elimination and momentum control, but that was about it for PvP. So much for the supposed renewed focus on PvP with the launch of Shadowkeep. Iron Banner remained basically the same, but brought a new armor set, yet not any new weapons, and Trials of Osiris would still be on hiatus. We did see some new pinnacle weapons added, I mean, ritual weapons. After the year of Forsaken and the pinnacle weapons being absolute powerhouses, Bungie decided to instead make ritual weapons which could be earned in the same way as pinnacle weapons, only they would be much less powerful and didn't have unique overpowered perks anymore. This season would bring Edgewise for the Vanguard, Exit Strategy for Gambit, and Randy's Throwing Knife for Crucible. Shadowkeep brought a few new exotics as well. Six exotic weapons, one of which was a Destiny 1 weapon, and only three new armor pieces. It was a bit light on exotics this time, but the weapons that came with Shadowkeep were pretty sick. Deathbringer, Ariana's Vow, Xenophage, Divinity. These were some great weapons that felt more unique than anything else that had come before. And although Xenophage wasn't great at launch, it would receive a 50% buff in damage a bit later that would make it much, much better. The Sandbox would receive quite a few changes, buffs and nerfs across the board, but one of the most impactful ones would be a nerf to Rally Barricade and Well of Radiance. These would auto-reload your weapons during the Year of Forsaken, which trivialized most PvE content, and this was a much-needed nerf, and despite some complaints early on, I think most people realized it was probably good for the game. And now it's time to talk about Armor 2.0, which was the biggest change and addition to the core system of the game. For one thing, all armor now has six separate stats rather than the three before. In Destiny 1, we had Intellect, Discipline, and Strength. In Destiny 2, prior to Shadowkeep, had Mobility, Armor, and Recovery. With Shadowkeep, this would all now be combined. This would be one of the best changes made to armor. All armor could be farmed until you found those perfect armor pieces that could accommodate your preferred type of build on your character now. 
What wasn't quite perfect at this time was the mod system, which locked some pretty important ammo reserve mods behind specific elements for your armor piece. And at the time, you couldn't spend any currency to switch the element of your armor, meaning that if you got an absolute god rolled piece of armor, but it was the wrong elements for the mods you wanted, then you were just shit out of luck. This would be a major failure of the original 2.0 armor system that had way too many layers of RNG. And complaints were through the roof about the elemental affinity portion of the RNG, as the rest of it was received mostly positive. Now we get to the Season of Undying which launched 4 days after Shadowkeep. The Vex Offensive was the primary activity, and initially impressions were good. It was fairly rewarding and wasn't too long to run. However, after the first week, it became pretty apparent that it was going to get stale very quickly. The event played the exact same every single time. Only one boss for the entire activity, there would be no bosses that would rotate each week, and the parts leading up to the final boss were the same encounters in the same rooms, unlike Menagerie which mixed things up a bit. Vex Offensive was initially a pretty good idea that just didn't pan out. The Vanguard in the tower were building a Vex portal near Ikora, and progress was being made each week on it leading up to the finale of the season. And what did that finale bring? The Undying Mine Destiny 1 Strike boss would now be the final boss of the Vex Offensive, for some reason. A pretty lackluster ending to an already lackluster activity. There was nothing unique about the boss either in terms of gameplay or rewards. I mean, how cool would it have been to bring back a Mago Loop or something that you could grind for? It would have made it worth farming, but instead, it kind of sucked. After the completion of the Garden of Salvation raid, the moon would be opened up to invasions by the Vex. Apparently the Vex were spilling out onto the moon drawn by the pyramid's influence after we defeated the Sanctified Mind in the raid. And these little invasions were cool, I guess, you know, it's a bit similar to the curse cycle being enacted in Forsaken, but definitely nowhere near as interesting or exciting. One of the more important additions during Season of Undying was the Seasonal Artifact. The artifact acted as a way to unlock mods that would be exclusive to this 3 month time frame, as well as increase your power level beyond whatever the maximum gear score was. The mods were a pretty interesting system, and they were fun to try out with Armor 2.0, but the artifact power was just a way to give the game an endless feeling of progression. So in the past when you could reach maximum power level with your characters, and feel like you completed that part of the game and focus on farming weapons or armor, now with the Seasonal Artifact, your power level just never stopped going up, as you continued to level up XP. Now personally, I dislike this, not everyone will feel that way, but I think it's kind of a dumb way to pat out the grind and give the illusion of a never-ending sense of progression. Even after the maximum pinnacle gear level, you just didn't feel like you completed anything. And this was likely by design, to give players a never-ending number that goes up and resets every season. Another controversy relating to the Artifact were the Champion mods. Champions were a new enemy type in Shadowkeep which included Barrier, Overload, and Unstoppable. The only way to deal with these enemy types and their mechanics were to use Champion mods which would allow you to stun them. The problem was, these mods could only be applied to specific weapons, meaning it forced you to use those specific weapons for activities with Champions. Even the new raid had Champions. And rightfully, Champions were not received too well amongst players. Not necessarily because of the mechanics of the Champions, which I think are fine on their own, but just the fact that the game forced specific loadouts in order to deal with them. This was pretty annoying. It would take quite a while before players would come around to getting used to champions in the game. And again, I want to reiterate, champions aren't all that bad, but forced loadouts sucked and continues to suck in the game today. I get why Bungie did it. They wanted to make each season feel like they will have weapons that are more prominent for those three months in order to keep the game fresh, but that should be done with sandbox tuning not restricting loadout choices. A battle pass was added to Destiny 2 for the first time ever with Shadowkeep and included a new armor set and some new cosmetics, as well as upgrade materials and stuff like that. The battle pass itself wasn't all that exciting, but it was nice to get a few extra new rewards. But Eververse continued to thrive during this season, receiving probably the most amount of cosmetics we've ever seen before. Tons of great looking loot was exclusive to Eververse, including items that were very Shadowkeep themed that probably should have been rewards for things like the dungeon, or strike specific loot for the Scarlet Keep or something. And this is when Eververse really began to become a major problem for Destiny 2 and loot aspiration. This 3 month time frame was really held up by Shadowkeep and its content because Season of the Undying would go down as probably the weakest seasonal offering we'd received so far. Was it totally fair to compare the seasons we'd seen during the Forsaken year, which had help from other studios in the case of Season of Opulence at least, bringing raids and such to beef up their value? 
Maybe, maybe not, but still that doesn't matter to the paying customer who paid the same for the Season of Opulence as they did for Season of Undying. To wrap up Shadowkeep's launch month, we'd get Festival of the Lost, the Haunted Forest would make a return from last year, and we'd get some new masks, armor, and a weapon that had random rolls so it could be farmed for, and there weren't much complaints with the event this time as Festival of the Lost remains a fan favorite event. Shadowkeep and Season of the Undying as a whole was a pretty underwhelming experience. To those who didn't play Destiny 1 and experience the moon before, maybe this was a bit more exciting for you, but for veteran players especially, the novelty of the moon wore off a bit quicker. Both the raid and dungeon weren't nearly as good as Forsaken's, there was just a lot less content than Forsaken overall. Far less strikes, far less crucible maps, no additions to Gambit really, and it just kind of felt like a large season, rather than an expansion. And one of the more vocal complaints revolved around Shadowkeep being a reskin expansion, filled with some reskinned weapons and armor from previous seasons, the moon from Destiny 1, and much of the campaign and post-campaign content revolved around killing enemies we've already killed before, in places we've already fought them. Now Shadowkeep wasn't all bad, there were some cool ideas, but it just didn't feel worthy of comparison to previous fall expansions, and thus far would probably be the weakest one across Destiny 1 and Destiny 2. After Season of Undying, expectations for the next few seasons weren't really high either, but players hoped they'd be better than the Undying. 